Okay, so um, this is the first time I've done this in many years, and maybe you'll find out partly why. Um, uh, an offhand remark was made some months ago that uh, you should do Mark uh, Matthew 18, and uh, I looked at it for a while, and then as time went by, I spent uh, a month or so trying to avoid that. Um, one of my avoidances was Second Peter chapter one, that somebody else did last week. Just to let me know that uh, I was that was not the track. So. Uh, I'm going to have to keep doing this because if my mouth, if my throat gets too dry, I'll end up coughing and we'll get to dinner soon. But So uh, expect that. Um, so uh, let's start off with prayer. Our Father, uh, your people are here. They're needy. They need something from your word some reproof, some rebuke, some exhortation, some edifying. Pray that you'd provide each of us individually what we need. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this isn't starting off too well, but... So Matthew 18, in case you didn't get that. Uh... All right, so uh, verse 1, and at the same time came the disciples, all right, I'm going to stop there already, um, I was going to make a joke that uh, since uh, this isn't going to be a series, there'll be no introduction, um, but the joke's on me, and as my kids would tell you, I'm not very funny anyway, so there is going to be an introduction. Um, and we're going to start right here at the same time. So what, what time? So let's go back into chapter 17. And we're going to just skim through this. Well, so verse 24. And when they were come to Capernaum, and I'm going to leave off the rest of the verse because that's not the point. And I'm going to skip to verse 25. And he said, yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him. So the point I'm trying to get at is that, uh, that they were in Capernaum and they were in the house. It's just a little strange, the house. And it turns out that there's a house in Capernaum that is mentioned several times. Or that there's not a particular house, but there's a the house in Capernaum. So let's go to Mark chapter 2. So when the disciples were told to uh, go off and to preach in different, and they were sent out two by two, they were told to to ask in the town and find who was worthy and to stay in their house. And the Im implication is kind of don't don't jump from house to house. That's what he told his disciples. Um, Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch there was no room to receive them. No, not so much about the door, and he preached the word unto them. So this, at this point, which I believe is earlier, he went to the house, uh, and I assume it was probably the same house, and there were so many people there that, that you couldn't even get in the door. And we know this story if we, if we were to read the whole thing, which isn't. Um, in the end, they had a, a man sick of the palsy on a, on a bed. And they actually had to take the roof. They had clamp on the roof, take it apart, and lower him down into him. So this house was probably somewhat large, but had been known to be overrun by the people that were following Christ. Uh, or at least who wanted uh, healing. 
Uh, a little more about Capernaum, uh, Matthew 11, 23. I know I'm flipping the pages. I have it all written down. But um, Matthew eleven twenty three, And now Capernaum, which was exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the wor mighty works which were done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. So Jesus was in Capernaum a lot, which was what I was trying to get at. But not only was he there a lot, but he did so many miracles in Capernaum that Jesus said, if they were done in Sodom, Sodom, that Sodom would have, been, in essence, repented, at least to some extent, to the point that it wouldn't have been destroyed. And we know from Genesis, what was that, five or ten uh, people all, uh, would be, were saved, then, then that, would, uh, that would save the whole city. Sodom, I mean, is there... Sodom was where, and one of the things that, that got, gets me about Sodom is, uh, so they were, the two angels showed up in the city, and they were doing what Sodomites are named after doing, uh, or wanted to do to these two people, and they were shut in the house, and so they were going out, they were trying to break the door down, um, Lot came out and tried to send them away, We'll go there, but um, the angels eventually blinded them. So what did these people do? If you had lost your sight, do you think maybe you would have, I got a bigger problem, I got my sight, I can't see? No, they didn't just keep trying to look for the door. The scripture says they wearied themselves looking for the door. That's, the point is that Sodom. Capernaum saw so many miracles, so many mighty works, that if that was done in Sodom, they would remain to this, to this day. So just trying to tell you a little about Sodom, I mean a little about Capernaum, that they were that hard-hearted that, uh, that they were in essence worse than Sodom in some ways, at least in their hard-heartedness. Um, and I think the religious leaders may have had a lot to do with that. Religion is a great way to keep people away from Christ. Um, and and they, were, they were always quick to say to the, to, never a man spoke like this. Have any of the leaders turned to this guy? Come on. So religion is a great way to keep people away from Christ. All right. Uh, so back to Matthew, um, Matthew 18. Excuse me. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus. So they're in the, the point is they're in the house in Capernaum. And they came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So they had just got done with a long, keep in mind, we have to put ourselves in their place just to understand it. They just moved from city to city. They just came to Capernaum. They've got hours walking down the road. Discussions come up. So they were having a discussion. Uh, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So is this like some highbrow? Oh, I think it's uh, the angel Gabriel. Oh, no, I think it's... No, that wasn't what they were doing. This is not highbrow. This is... Uh, so for a little more context on this, let's go to Mark 9, 33. So this is a parallel. Um, a parallel passage. Uh, and he came to Capernaum. And being in the house, he asked them, what was it that you disputed amongst yourself on the way? So they're talking about this. This is a long walk. It's probably hours and hours of, of walking. So at some point in this, they, he said, so what were you discussing? 
Um, verse 34, does this not sound like us? But they held their peace, for by the way they disputed amongst themselves who should be the greatest. They're talking amongst themselves, as we probably read before. And uh, I'll just read Luke 9, 46. And then arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be the greatest? And this was in the same context. This was the same trip. Um, so the disciples are, are, are talking amongst themselves, saying, you know, hey, who, who do you think of us is going to be the greatest? And we saw a bunch of this. And, and, and James and John did this in particular, it seems. And not only that, their mother came in and did it too. So this was a common uh, thing among the disciples. Um, so, and we, I don't know about you, but I picture, when I picture they're going from city to city, I picture Jesus and then the 12 guys around him. And that's it. But So we keep thinking that there's, there's just 12 disciples following him. And, uh, and that's the, the end of the story. But let's just go to Acts 1, verse 21 for a minute. So um, what's happened here is uh, um, uh, Judas has uh, committed suicide. Judas is no longer one of the disciples. The, the fact that they had 12 seems so ingrained in them, or perhaps Christ said it ha there has to be a 12, there has to be this group of 12. But that was so ingrained in them that... Uh, that now that one was lost, they, they were uh, intent on, on replacing that. So, um, so, so they had to fill uh, Judas' uh, vacancy. Excuse me, verse 21. So who are they going to choose? Wherefore, of those men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus was in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of the resurrection. So there were clearly more than 12. I mean, from we're talking about starting at the baptism of John all the way through to the resurrection. There were some that were accompanied with them this whole time. Um, it just, I, I'm, I'm stuck with this picture of 12. Now, I'm sure some will come and gone, and we'll see a little of some in, uh, indication of that. But they, they at least had two other guys that they picked from that had been with them essentially the whole time. Because they had been missing it from, you know, I don't know exactly. We do know that Jesus sometimes actually called apart the 12. We're going to see that in a minute. We also know that he called apart uh, sometimes three of them. So a couple chapters before Matthew 18, he called Peter, James, and John up to the to the uh, um, to the Mount of Transfiguration, as we call it, and showed them that. Now, after that, they're coming into this group talking about, "Hey, who's going to be the greatest?" We went up and saw. Oh, oh I can't tell you because Jesus said, "Don't tell anybody." Tell no man until I'm resurrected, which they never could get this resurrection part down. Um, but um, so uh, I can't tell you. Do you know what we saw? I can't even tell you. I mean, <laughs> who's going to be the greatest amongst us? So this is the discussion that's going on. Um, I have secrets I can't even tell you. So do you, do you think? Peter was prideful. Do you think they were, oh, yeah, it's going to be me. James and John, we already we talked about them. All right. Um, so, um, okay, so there were a whole bunch, but in the in the concept of where we are now, 
they're talking about who's the greatest. So it doesn't show it as well in, uh, in uh, Matthew, but if we go to the parallel uh, in, in Mark, Mark 9.35, don't bother turning there, and Jesus, and he sat down and he called the twelve and said of them, if any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. That's just to show you the context. So Jesus called the twelve aside. Now they're still in the house. This house has, I mean, people live there, probably not the, the twelve disciples or Jesus. Somebody else lives there, even if it's one of their families. Then there's a family. There's probably the neighbors or whoever is interested in the town is coming by to see. We know that it, at other times they filled the place. So I, I'm just trying to give you a picture. There's probably a whole slew of people in this house. And um, but so Jesus called apart the twelve because they were probably the ones that were arguing the most about um, who shall be the greatest. Anyways. All right, let's get back to where we were started, which is Matthew 18, um, verse 2. And Jesus called a little child unto him. So I'm sure there were children around in the house. They probably lived there, or they may be the neighbors. And set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted... And become as a little child, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So, weren't, weren't the disciples already, for the most part, somewhat convert? What is this? What are we, where are we going here? So, I don't know about you, but I have always heard it talked about. It's, it's childlike faith. Right? I mean, how many people haven't heard it's shallow. I think even when I was lost and listening to lost preachers, if, if you want to call them that, they would tell me that this, we're talking about childlike faith here, right? Childlike faith. Everyone's heard childlike faith. Any opposed? Uh, so, as my kids will tell you, I'm not very funny. So, um, any abstain? No. All right. Um, so, in Timothy, so uh, I didn't write down the chapter, but oh no no no! All right, sorry. Um, I am uh, so. I mean, absolutely, we we are supposed to have faith, but um, I'll just go. Get rid of the rabbit trails and go right in. So um, a month or so ago, uh, Tim gave a message on humility. Well, guess what? I read this, this uh, section after that uh, again, af after that. And the next verse, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as a little child, the same is the greatest in heaven. That's what he's talking about. I looked through the scripture. I tried to find faith and child. In the same verse, now there could be other words used for that, and, and maybe I missed it. But I didn't find anything about childlike faith anywhere in Scripture. Jesus is, Jesus is telling us what he means by this. He means humble yourself. This is about humility. Now, now, it kind of, now does it fit in a little? These guys were arguing about who's going to be the greatest, and, and be a childlike faith doesn't fit. Humility. Oh, wait. So humble yourself as a little child. So do you ever hear a child in the middle of a bunch of adults trying to tell you, let me tell you how it is. Let me tell you, I'm going to be the, I'm the greatest. It just doesn't fit, at least in, in that, in that, in those times. Um, so we're, we're to learn about uh, humility. And, and childlike faith really doesn't work. Because, uh, I mean, it is the first step. So the first step is we need faith, but, but childlike faith is childish faith. I mean, children will believe, especially a, children that, a child that's so small that you're going to pick them up. I don't know how, how it works with your kids, but once they get beyond the toddler age, they, they're not so much into the being picked up thing. 
So these are probably very small children, and uh, their their faith is very is very simple. I mean, you can they have faith in the Easter Bunny, they have faith in the in the other things that aren't true. It's 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 not a good faith. It, it, it's great to have faith. I'm just going to believe whatever's in the Bible when you first get saved. But you don't know what's in there. So we're to, we're to grow in faith, as Scripture tells us. Um, and we're not to stay childish. For, um, I think it was 1 Corinthians 13. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, and I, I know this has to do with Scripture, uh, then, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. So we're not to stay in childish faith. We're to add to our faith. Um, and I'm going to forget the verses. <laughs> oh, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience. And to patience, godliness. And I'm dying to go off on this because this was one of my other messages. But, um, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, ye make that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So faith, faith is critical. Faith is the, is the foundation in, in, in much of this. But we need to get beyond childish faith. We need to test our faith. We need to learn the scriptures. We need to know this. This is it's important that we that we not have childish faith. But as Jesus was trying to tell us, we should have childish humility. So we should have childlike humility. That's what we're to learn from this. Excuse me, not not the faith from that. Excuse me. All right, back to Matthew 18. And who, uh, verse 5. And whoso, whoso shall receive one such child in my name receiveth me. So Jesus is going to go off on this, uh, on this uh, talking about children, it appears. But, I mean... Nearly all the time, Jesus is using earthly examples to teach something else. I mean, is this not just all that he does, it seems? I'll give a few examples. Um, so the, uh, the disciples were in a boat, and Jesus said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. So the disciples went off and said, and they reasoned amongst themselves, saying, it is because we have taken no bread. I tell you what, if I was Jesus, I'd be constantly going. <laughs> he has patience with us. Why? Partly because we're childlike to him. We're, we're infants to him. We are so infantile compared to the Lord in our understanding, in our knowledge, in all that. Anyways, um, but they reason amongst themselves, it's bread. And he has to come back and says, no, no, I'm talking about the doctrine of levancy, le levancy uh, of the Pharisees. Um, so the woman at the well, John 4, whosoever drinketh of this water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be him, in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. So the woman says, Unto him, sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. Now, you got to kind of put yourself into their mindset. You go home, you want water, the faucet comes on, the bottle of water comes out, you want to clean something, you turn on the faucet. We have, in, you know, water in our house coming through pipes. These people had new water in their house, they had to hike. 20 minutes, half an hour, a mile or two, to the town central well to get all the water they're probably going to drink 
for the entire day. Anything they're going to use to cook with, to clean with, comes in that trip a mile or two, half a mile, to the central well in the center of the town. So she's sitting there going, I'll never thirst to have, she's, this is great. I'm just saying, you, you don't see what a huge thing this was to her. And uh, of course, she, she didn't get it because none of us would get it. Um, that he wasn't talking about water. He was talking about uh, um, spiritual things, but he always used that as my point. And the, the most impactful one is in John 6, and I'm just going to quickly go through this. Uh, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, my blood is drink indeed. So verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? it and uh, and I, I and eventually it says that many of his disciples stopped following him at that point. So that brings us back to there were more people with him than the twelve, but also this was such a hard saying that they that they stopped following him. And Jesus said in verse 63, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you believe not, for Jesus knew who would believe and betray him. Oh, all right, here's the verse. And, and from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So Jesus is constantly using this, uh, these spiritual examples of of um, physical things. So what I'm trying to what I'm trying to tell you is, I don't think he's really talking about children here. He's talking about his followers who may be children to him, ish, childish to him. But this is he, he he's not spending all this time talking about children. So the real application is to those is to believers. So let's get back to Matthew 18 again and verse 6. So with that in mind, now he can be talking about children too, but that's not the main thrust of this. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him than a millstone were hanged about his neck and that they were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe unto that man to whom the offense cometh. So, so we're not talking about little children primarily here. We're talking about what did, what did we learn about children? Is it it's humility, right? So, so the opposite of humility, and in fact, the world will tell you if you don't stand up for yourself, who will, right? Well, there's an answer to that. God will. So we have an example. Moses. Well, Moses is one of the meekest men on earth uh, uh, is, is mentioned in Scripture. So Moses went out there, and there were times when, for instance, Moses uh, married the Ethiopian woman, and uh, Aaron and, and uh, Miriam went after him. They didn't like that. See, there was problems with interracial marriage even back then. Um, so, and, and who defended Moses? Did Moses come out and say, hey, you, nope, didn't say a word. The Lord came down and he said, hey, you guys stand over there. Moses stand over there. I'm going to decide. And he decided for Moses. He took care of Moses. Later on, they're deciding, you know, why do you lead us? Why is it you and Aaron that are leading us? Right? Did, did Moses come out and say, well, because... I went on the mountain. Uh, he didn't defend himself. The Lord came down and defended him. So, yes, humility has the implication of, of it has the implication of being weak. It's not weak. It's meek. It's, I'm going to let the Lord defend me. I'm not going to go out and attack people. The Lord can defend me. And let's, let's look a little 
Um, oh, I wanted to put in. So we read this. I have notes for a reason, I guess. Um, but who so offended one of these little ones? It were better that a mill that 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 a millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown in the depths of the sea. And woe into the world. Does it sound like somebody's getting a little energized here? Not me, but this in scripture. Does it sound like Christ? It sounds to me like he's a little angry. I think he's, he's angry because he's seeing what's going to happen to his followers in the future, or maybe soon. Um, and some people think, well, Christ, you know, the Christ doesn't get angry. Oh, Mark 3, 5. And when he had looked around about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, stretch forth thy hand. And he stretched it out and was restored. God gets angry. The Lord gets angry with the wicked, every, is angry with the wicked every day. There are plenty of times where God gets angry. Um, we're told, be angry and sin not. It doesn't say, be not angry and sin not. It says, be ye angry and sin not. Because we will get angry. He gets angry. Um, anyways, I guess I wanted to throw that in there. But uh, so in Deuteronomy uh, alone, the scripture says the Lord was angry at least four times. So the Lord is angry. He gets angry. He was angry at Israel. Surely he gets angry at us because we've earned it. At least I have. Um, all right, let's get back to Matthew. <laughs> My notes keep telling me, get back to Matthew 18. Okay. Uh, Yes. All right. So we will not get very far. So verse 8. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off, cast them from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life, halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet be cast in everlasting fire. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather have two eyes to be cast into hellfire. I don't know about you, but I like to skip this verse, these verses. I don't want to. I don't want to think about my sin. It would better be better off if I cut my hand off than that I offend. And I think. Um, so, offend. The word of the Greek word behind offend. Um, I'm going to read you a few of the definitions. Um, I t oh, the word is so so I can pretend I can pronounce uh, Greek words too. Uh, it's skandalizu, um, which is in fact where we get our word scandalize. So. Um, and it's, so the, the first definition, to put a stumbling block or impedance in the way upon which another may trip and fall, to offend, to entice to sin, to cause a person to become, to begin to distrust and desert one whom he ought to trust and obey, to cause to fall away, to be offended in one. In other words, to see in another what I disapprove of and what hinders me from acknowledging his authority to cause one to judge unfavorably or unjustly of another. How many of this stuff do we do? How, many, how hard is it not to offend, especially the lost, by, by doing some of these things? It's just this is like a litany of what we, sh what we should not do, but what is so difficult to not do sometimes. So... A lot of what we're talking about here is not just a stumbling block to us, but I think he's trying to say this this definition seems to be um, have have lots of implications also to others. So now throw that in there. The Lord says you'd be better off cutting your hand off than to offend others also. Not just cause yourself to trip, but in your trip and, and think of it, in your tripping up. 
How many other people who see that are going to stumble with that? So we'd be better off to pull an eye out. I mean, how, how disturbing is that to you? Um, cut a hand off, cut a foot off. These are, this is pretty disturbing. The guy who said this knows this better than we do. This is disturbing. This is how important keeping from offending, from causing others to stumble, from causing other people to fall, and keeping ourselves from it, that we don't do that also. All right, like we usually do reading that, let's move on. I do, seriously, you read that, and it's like, I, I, I just can't deal. I don't, I don't know what this cutting the foot off thing is, but uh, that's how serious it is. So just to let that sink in a little more, but uh, that's what we do when we offend and, and offend, the offend the lost by, um, by showing our sin. That okay, back to... Uh, Matthew 18, verse 10. I assume that's where I left off. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. So the meek Christian, the meek believer, what, what, is, what is he trying to say there? So the meek believer has his angel up in heaven at the, at the right hand, beholding the face of God. So you think you're in trouble if you're meek, if you're a child of God and meek. You've got an angel that's going there. Lord, uh, how, about we, uh, how about we take care of that? Or if you're the one offending that person, you got, this sounds to me, I hate to say this, this sounds like a threat. If you have any concept of what an angel is, so when Paul, when uh, when uh, David numbered the the people of Israel, which he wasn't supposed to do, and uh, and the uh, and the repercussions of that came about. At one point, it says, "And an angel stood over Jerusalem, and I believe with his sword, an angel was going to destroy Jerusalem." So an angel in your defense is a wonderful thing. An angel going after you because you've offended one of these uh, other Christians. If you offend a brother and sister in Christ, they've got an angel in heaven that's, that, that may get uh, allowed to, to uh, defend them, to be vengeance for the Lord. Um, just saying that there ain't. What, what is he trying to say there? I think it's a threat. I think it's a threat. You leave. You watch yourself. Do not offend my little children. Um. So um, take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. So I'm going to pretend I can do Greek again. Despise. Uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce it. So. So, um, to contemn, despise, disdain, to think little or nothing of. So, here we are, the, the 12 disciples, they're thinking, oh, those guys, the ones that didn't come to the Mount of Transfiguration, yeah, 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 they're not, they're not, they're, yeah, yeah. When you think you're going to be the greatest in, in, in heaven, what are you thinking of everybody else? So, so this angel is there to defend, apparently to defend or to, to speak up on behalf of the ones that are being humble that everyone else is going, we just, you're, you're nothing. Um, okay, so back to Matthew 18, uh, verse 11. For the Son of Man is come 
to save that which was lost. Sort of thrown in there a little bit. But um, how do you make these children? So Christ came to create more uh, little children who, who, who uh, trust him. But, uh, and, and this is our mission. This is his mission. He came from this. It, 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 there are other scriptures where Jesus says the whole point of me coming to earth was to die for, for the lost. Shouldn't this be we? Shouldn't this be our main function in life? Shouldn't we be? If this was Christ, he just threw this in here. If uh, if that was his job, he that's why he came. If you see him, if you go through scripture and say, why is he here? It's to seek and to save. It's to die for those that are lost. To to to, see, to save sinners. This should be our primary uh, function. Um, if it was his, seems like it ought to be ours. All right. Um, so I um, forgot to watch for time. All right. We're <laughs> uh, all right. Verse 12. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, Doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be he be found, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth, rejoiceth more in that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not of the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So this doesn't seem to follow, or it doesn't seem to, but he's looking after the little ones again. Who are the little ones? Again, the meek, the believers that are, that are meek, the children of God that are meek, and, that, and, and who apparently are, uh, are subject to the stumbling blocks. Because we've heard a lot about the stumbling blocks and, and, and being despised and all this. So... If one of these goes astray, don't get me wrong. I, I understand that God is uh, omniscient and omnipotent and that, that, uh, that he's still watching. But he's trying to show you that, that how, how a shepherd, how a man, one of them is going to stray. The entire, um, he leaves the other ones. He is completely... Uh, distracted with, I have to find that one lost one, the one that, that, that stumbled, the one that fell, the one that got away. That's where he's going. That, that's what he's getting at. This is my biggest, and he, he makes it even more um, clear that if he find it, verily I send you, he rejoiceth more over that one sheep. Oh, I got him back. This is huge. I'm more happy about this than the fact that all the rest of you stayed. So this is um, this is maybe as far as I'm going to get. But uh, so it's very important. No, don't cause people to stumble. Don't cause yourself to stumble. Um, humility from from Tim's message. Um, and if, if there's a brother or sister that, that does fall away, we need to get Christ dropped everything in his, in his parable uh, thing here to get that one brother back. If somebody gets offended, we need to drop everything. And I mean, I know we can't drop everything per se, but... That's what he's trying to tell us, that this is the most important thing. It's not so much keeping the 99, that, that's great, I'm going to leave them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go get that one, I'm going to get that one back. So this is how, this is what Christ thinks of, of what's important for, uh, for that. Now, the rest of the church, we need to grow up, not, be, not have childish faith, so we can... 
unlike sheep, we can uh, take care of ourselves for a while. Obviously, Christ doesn't leave and none of that. But but uh, but he's essentially saying, I'm going to go after that one. You guys hold your own. So we need to be ready to hold our own. Um, maybe unintendedly, I just stumbled on something that, that is hitting the church right now, but the shepherd went off to find that one lost sheep. The rest of us should be holding together um, so that because when he came back, there was still 99 there. So um, uh, probably two more messages, but we don't have time. So, <laughs> so uh, let's pray. Let's let's thank the Lord for uh, the meal that's coming up and uh, help us to be a servant. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, for your word, for all the strange and unusual things that you have to do to get our attention, to uh, to get us to understand, to uh, to get us to follow you. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to uh, better understand, to better grow, to add to our faith. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for this meal. We thank you for all those that help with it. Pray that you would help us to be uh, helpful in those areas where you would will that we want us to in uh, in taking care of this and uh, to be your servants, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.